Good evening, everyone. I'm Allison Sirkouf, Chair of the Aeronautics Committee. And together with the Transportation Committee and, of course, Vaughn College, we'd like to thank the New York City Bar Association for hosting us this evening. And of course, welcome everyone. We hope you enjoy tonight's event. It seems we can't go a single day in the news without a drone story, so tonight's panel discussion should be timely, if nothing else. Um, and I just have a couple of announcements. One is that I just need to make everyone aware that tonight's event is being filmed. So um, just be aware of that <laughs> in your comments and such. And also, on behalf of the Transportation Committee, I just want to make an announcement that on Tuesday, April 28th, from 6 to 8, we're having an event at the Association, and by we, I mean the Transportation Committee, um, on um, autonomous vehicles. So if you're interested in drones, that may be something that's of interest to you, and you can find more information on the New York City Bar Association website. If you go to the calendar of events, there will be a hyperlink where you can learn how to RSVP. And so without further ado, I give you Sharon DeVivo, President of Vaughn College of Aeronautics and Technology. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. We are absolutely thrilled to be here. Uh, this is, as Allison said, this is such a timely event um, with the notice of proposed rulemaking out from the FAA, and it seems like we can't go a day without a story about UAVs. And so we're very excited to be here and to help host this event. Um, we're thrilled to listen in on the conversation, and um, our moderator, Douglas McQueen, will introduce the panel in greater detail in a moment. And this evening would not have been possible with the Aeronaut without the Aeronautics Committee of the New York City Bar Association, so I'd just like to say thank you very much to them. And also to our special committee that put this together, which included Alice and Doug and Loretta. And uh, I think we put together a great event and hope to maybe do something like this in the future. So I thought I'd talk a little bit just for very briefly about the college. For some of you, this may be the first time you're really coming in contact with anybody. And there's a whole bunch of students manning our tables in the back. Uh, both from our UAV club management and engineering department. We also have several faculty members here, including the chair of our management department, our vice president for academic affairs, engineering faculty, flight faculty. As you can imagine, for an institution that has degrees in engineering, aviation, management, and technology, we could design them, we can build them, we can pilot them, we can manage them, we can maintain them. We can do all those things. Um, that's really who, who we are and, and what we do. We're located right across the street from LaGuardia Airport. So next time you take off from LaGuardia, off runway 04, if you're on the right side of the airplane, that's us right across the street. Uh, we've been there since 1941 uh, and offer master's, bachelor's, and associate degrees in all aspects of aviation, engineering, technology, and management. Uh, we serve a great, diverse population of students. We're recognized by the U.S. Department of Education as a Hispanic-serving institution and really reflect the diversity of this great city. Uh, Queens happens to be the most diverse county in the country, and we, we absolutely reflect that. About 1,600 students. We have a residence hall uh, and a UAV club, which I talked about, as well as robotics and lots of things that complement uh, the programs that we offer. I'd just like to say thank you again to the Aeronautics Committee, thank you again to the New York City Bar Association, and I'm really looking forward to listening in on this great conversation. So with that, I turn it over to Doug. Thank you, Sharon. very timely and lively topic. We have a, a great panel put together for you tonight, a panel that re represents a variety of backgrounds and a variety of viewpoints, but all with a keen interest in unmanned aircraft. So uh, what I'm hoping to do is, uh, as moderator, pitch questions to our panel on a variety of topics. Um, some of them may be legal topics, others non-legal. We know we have some lawyers here, non-lawyers. We have students, uh, people who are familiar with unmanned aircraft and those who are unfamiliar. So we'll try and keep it as uh, interesting as possible for those of you that do have the technical knowledge, but keep it as simplified as possible so that we don't lose anyone in the conversation. Um, what I thought I'd do first is introduce our panel members here to my immediate left. I have Loretta Alpeleg, who is uh, an adjunct professor at the Vaughan College 
and a former FAA Regional Counsel. Loretta is an avid drone pilot, and I've had the good pleasure of seeing the photos that she takes from her unmanned aircraft, and they're fantastic. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, to Loretta's left, we have Chris Baum, who is the Manager of Engineering and Operations at ALPA, the Airline Pilots Association. Chris is uh, involved at ALPA with accident investigations and airworthiness uh, issues that ALPA deals with. He's participated on several rulemaking and advisory committees uh, in the aviation world. And uh, just for full disclosure, I am also an Alpha member, and I'm very glad for Chris's work. Uh, on the other side of the podium, to Chris's left, is Brendan Schulman. Brendan is the special counsel at uh, Kramer, Levin, Naftalis, and Frankel here in New York City, where he heads their unmanned aircraft practice. Bre Brendan has represented a handful of unmanned aircraft operators, probably more than anyone I know so far, including uh, in the very famous case of uh, Raphael Perker versus the FAA. Uh, Brennan was the lead counsel on that case. And uh, <coughs> I like your title, Brennan, that Bloomberg TV likes to call you the drone man. <laughs> so Brennan is that guy here on our panel tonight. To Brennan's left is Ben Klein. Ben is a member of our Aeronautics Committee here on the New York City Bar. He uh, is the principal of the Klein Law Firm here in New York City. He's been a commercial litigator for 20 years and he's also a licensed pilot. And to Ben's left, finally, last but not least, is Jay Stanley. Jay is a senior policy analyst at the American Civil Liberties Union. Uh, where Jay writes about technology-related civil rights issues, including those related to unmanned aircraft. So with that, I'm going to start by giving each panel member an opportunity to just give us a 60-second elevator speech about their position or their opinion of the unmanned aircraft industry, where they think it's going, what their feelings are, and perhaps maybe a representative opinion of the organization that they represent. So why don't I start with you, Loretta? Well, I think this is a very exciting time for our students and, and anyone that loves new technology and new opportunities. And, and I feel it's a very exciting time to be in aviation. Unfortunately, I don't feel we've had the support from the FAA or from the government that we really need to be able to exploit the technology. And I fear that we're going to lose our preeminence in aviation if we don't uh, immediately put in place rules and regulations that will support uh, commercialization and support academic research and support our ability to uh, continue to exploit this new technology. And I do want to say that it was my students that first interested me in drones. So I uh, thank them and blame them for my new obsession. <laughs> uh, from what I understand, uh, you don't end up with, uh, you don't just have one drone, you end up with very many, is that correct? That's right, I've just bought my third. Wait, wait, and that's the man I bought it from. <laughs> is he selling here tonight? <laughs> Uh, Chris? Oh, thank you, Doug. And uh, thanks to the Bar Association and Vaughn for having ALPA on the panel. Uh, I think contrary to what some of you may think, uh, ALPA is very much not against UAS. We think the technology has a lot of promise. Uh, we fully recognize the, the societal benefits and the, the potential for using UAV in applications that keep people out of harm's way. Uh, know the technology has a lot of application in the in the traditionally piloted aircraft world as well. Uh, the one thing that drives our positions and our activity in the UAV world is the safety of the national airspace system, nothing else. Uh, we, we jealously guard the safety record that air, aviation in general, airline aviation in particular, has, has achieved over the, the last several decades. It's unmatched anywhere in the world. Uh, and it got there through a lot of hard work of testing, training, 
design, all kinds of things, as most of you know, go into the safe operation of a modern airline aircraft. Uh, and that process is admittedly ponderous at times, but it is that deliberation and that depth of investigation that allows us all to get on an airplane and take safety as an absolute given. And so we're gonna to continue to jealously guard that safe record of aviation. Thank you, Doug, and thank all of you for coming. Um, so Kramer 11 was the very first firm in the country to open a, an unmanned aircraft systems group or practice, and we also defended the very first case involving the commercial use of drones, and then went on to defend or assert the rights of people using drones in volunteer search and rescue for academic purposes, for commercial purposes, for education, um, and, and for hobby purposes as well. Just you know, people like Loretta who just enjoy it and want to continue enjoying it without burdensome regulation. And I think the theme throughout all of our representations, including the most recent, which has been to propose a so-called micro UAS category that would open up at least that very lightweight, small category for low altitude safe operations. The theme throughout all of our representations has been, this is really revolutionary new technology. It's gonna save lives. It's the, the, the benefits of the technology really outweigh some of the hazards or concerns that you more often read about in the newspapers, whether it's privacy or safety um, or, or concerns like that. I think when you actually study the benefits of the technology and what this will bring to society, uh, it, it's really amazing. And so what we want to see is, is sort of a, a reasonable approach to regulation and to legislation across the country so that our clients and also you know, people that I know personally can use and benefit from the technology in di different industries and in communities as well. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, Doug, for having me on the panel. Uh, first, I'd like to correct one thing you said, um, which was that I've been practicing uh, law 20 years. And that's upsetting to me because it means my six-month-old daughter has had a greater effect on my appearance than, than I thought. <laughs> um, it's about half that. I've been a pilot for 20 years, uh, practicing law for about 10. Uh, but uh, I guess, you know, sitting on this, this panel, I, I approached the drone issue wearing three hats. Um, I'd say one is as a lawyer representing uh, clients in the aerospace and aviation industries, and, um, and of course within the regulatory framework that they have to, to operate in those industries. Uh, the other is a pilot and is a user of the national airspace system. Um, and the third is this, someone who, like Brendan and others on this panel, are very excited about the possibilities that this technology offers, which is really probably some of the most exciting technology uh, that exists today and is, gonna, you know, is applicable to just a whole host of, of uses, but whether it's uh, conservation efforts, uh, life-saving efforts with search and rescue, air ambulance in remote places, in, in, uh, whether it's in the U.S. or in Africa. And um, you know, the U.S. has an opportunity to be at the forefront, uh, and maybe that window is closing, of the development of these technologies. And you know, I think when we're up here talking about drones, um, we have to remember drones are not one thing, they're, they're many things. And so when, as we develop regulations, I think we need to keep that in mind. And uh, again, as echoing something what Brennan said, there should be different tiers of regulation, sensible regulation, depending on weight of drones and, and where they're being flown. And, um, and, and once those regulations are developed, um, lawyers such as us will be in a position to more adequately serve our clients in terms of insurance issues, uh, stuff that we all are grappling with right now in the absence of, uh, of, of regulation. Okay. Thank you. So, um, you know, for the ACLU, our, my job is to look at new technologies and figure out how we can um, nudge it if necessary to ensure that technology serves individuals and empowers individuals and doesn't just empower um, large institutions at the expense of individuals, for example, their privacy, which is a huge issue, which, is, which was our entree and our, probably our primary concern around drones. Um, and we have called for regulation of police government use of drones. We have not called for any regulation at this time of the private sector use of drones. We are taking a wait and see attitude on that um, because I think it's too complicated. Um, drones, drones are a generative technology and there's gonna be a million and one uses for them. Um, some, many, many goods, some probably amazing and some bad, um, and we need to sort of see in an evolutionary sense how, how to, to what extent they actually do invade people's privacy and, uh, 
and or uh, um, you know impinge on their safety or drive them crazy or what have you. We actually don't have a dog in the fight over safety issues. Um, but uh, you know, not not only do drones raise privacy issues, but they also raise free speech issues. We are a photographers' rights organization. We have filed lawsuits all around the country defending the rights of photographers from police officers and others who tell them that they don't have a right to take photographs in public. Um, so the First Amendment issues complicate things for us, especially in the private sector. Um, and we also believe in the freedom to tinker. Um, we are a pro-technology organization. We want to see technology flower. Um, we think that technology, we can have our cake and eat it too. If we do things right and take time to think about it, we should be able to uh, get the benefits of this technology without giving up our privacy or other rights. Make Brendan smile. <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, everyone here on the panel mentioned what this technology is capable of doing and what the potential is. So why don't we talk about it for anyone who may not be aware about the scope of what this technology can do. If anyone wants to start us off about some of these potential uses, anyone? Well, there's so many exciting uses that's really only limited by your imagination. Right now, most of the uses appear to be in aerial data collection and videography and photography. Uh, but I think in the future, Google's or uh, Facebook is talking about using drones to uh, put Wi-Fi where there where there isn't Wi-Fi. But really, the, the uses of drones are, are something that, uh, as they get smaller and, and we find more ways to use them, for me as an environmentalist, one of the most exciting things is that you can do all kinds of environmental surveys now without uh, disrupting the animals that, that you are doing research on. And I find that to be a very exciting uh, use of drones. Brendan, have you represented anyone that involved with uh, agriculture with drones? Yes, but I can't tell you about it. <laughs> uh, look, agriculture is expected to be one of the, the biggest uh, industries for the use of, of this technology. And um, I mean, if you think about the way food is grown, we're sort of at the limit of doing things the old fashioned way. And so there's this uh, emerging industry of precision agriculture, data measurements, using precise amounts of pesticide and, and fertilizer. Uh, figuring out which parts of your field need a little bit more water, especially in California. We've got this huge drought out there, right? And that's where most of our fruit is growing. Uh, so to figure out you know, that only one corner of your field needs a little bit more water than the other can have a huge environmental benefit and, and also help you with, uh, with the production. It could save your crop. I, I've heard stories about you know, the vineyards out there. They'll, they'll go up, they'll, they'll fly a drone, and they can see based on the slight variation in the color of the leaf that one side of the vineyard is ready, is ripe for picking, and the other isn't. So they'll harvest those grapes first, and then they'll wait a week or two and harvest the rest, and the result is a, is a higher quality wine. So, I mean, there's really a million and one uses, and the one that I actually like the best is, uh, is the search and rescue. I had a client who was using drones now for 10 years to go out and try to find missing people, and there's one story that's just amazing. There was this, um, this two-year-old child who went missing, and they, they spent five days trying to find the child. They used boats, they used people on foot, ATVs, divers, <coughs> couldn't find the kid. And so at the last minute, the volunteer showed up with a, with a drone, which I would call model aircraft. I've been flying model aircraft for, 20, for over 20 years at this point. And with a camera in it, flew over the area just near the child's home and spotted a red color in the swamp. And it turned out, unfortunately, that was the child's body it was in this alligator-infested swamp. So they were able to make the recovery, have a funeral, have answers for the family as to what happened to the kid. There were alligators there. They probably would never have had those answers to the situation without the use of that very powerful and accessible and affordable technology. It didn't cost anything for a volunteer to show up with his drone, take some pictures, stitch them together with software, and say, I see a red spot. We should go see what that is. I think a very powerful real-life example of helping communities and helping families. I'll give another example, uh, sort of along those lines. Is in uh, you know drones are um, in in Africa right now being used pretty heavily for conservation efforts, and also um, it's a huge safety uh, improvement because the the forest rangers, the wildlife preserve rangers in Africa have put themselves on the front line against poaching for many years now, and there's been a huge loss of life. People don't know about it um, about the number of rangers who get killed and anti-poaching activities. And a lot of this work now is being transitioned to drones who can obviously 
operate above poachers and um, without fear of being, well, who, who cares if they get shot down, I guess is the question, much different than a manned helicopter that does the same work or a manned aircraft that have done that work. Um, and that's a, a very rapidly uh, expanding area of drone use and has an incredible potential. Again, in a way that we're not only talking about saving uh, animal lives, but, but human lives as well. well. I'll talk about two uh, uses quickly. One is uh, in some countries, especially where, where the, the rules are looser, you see drones being used by protesters to videotape police uh, actions during protests, which um, is the kind of photography that we, you know, we support. Um, you know, people, uh, citizens watching over their government rather than the other way around. Um, another use is in India, they're planning to use drones to distribute uh, pepper spray on crowds, to disperse crowds, um, which is, a, in our view, a terrible idea. Um, and I think that, broadly speaking, there's a pretty strong consensus in the U.S. against weaponized drones, at least for now. But um, you know, that, that is a reminder of where things could go. And I'll give another just a quick example of, of something like that in this country. There's a journalist um, uh, by the name of Will Potter, and this is sort of in the agricultural realm, but less on the factory farm side and more on the, the against factory farm, who's using drones to take aerial pictures of factory farms um, uh, across the country, farms that have really been off limits uh, to journalists because of uh, local laws that have been passed that they call ag-gag laws, stopping them from uh, taking pictures and, and obtaining evidence of what happens behind the, the closed doors of factory farms. So, you know, even even here in the U.S., their uh, drones are being used for that sort of um, journalism and protest efforts. Hey, Chris. Thank you. Uh, I, you know, I haven't heard anything I disagree with here. And cl clearly, as I mentioned earlier, there are a lot of tremendous societal benefits that can be derived from UAV, but I think if we're talking scope of use, uh, it's also important that we keep in mind that the conversation that we're having right now, uh, we all, I think, tend to think in terms of what you typically see as, you know, small rotorcraft type aircraft, uh, generally, you know, a foot or two, two feet across, lightweight, those kinds of things. But the conversation we're having is laying the framework for even, even in the current NPRM that the FAA has up to 55 pounds, and the, the rulemaking activity and the experimentation and, and technological development that's going on goes way beyond that. So I think it's important for us to keep in mind that the conversations we're having and the experimenting we're doing, the, the regulatory discussions that are going on, are laying the foundation for how we might operate uh, aircraft as large as a 737 in the airspace with other large aircraft carrying passengers and freight and those kinds of things. How so, possible is that in the not too distant future that maybe a FedEx or a UPS <coughs> will be flying freight around an unmanned aircraft? Is that something that's on the horizon? I don't think in the immediate future we're going to see that. Uh, the conversations that we've had with FAA uh, and with the manufacturers, frankly, suggest that the, the technological hurdles to overcome to actually safely operate a full-size airline type aircraft in the airspace by remote control are still some distance off. Uh, you know, as I mentioned in my opening comments, with the whole foundation of safety in, in airline operations and aviation in general is predicated on understanding what happens when things go wrong. And there's an awful lot of ways that failures could occur in a full-size aircraft being operated remotely. I have no doubt that someday that will happen. Uh, I don't think I'll see it before I retire. So how big of an industry are we talking about here? How, 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 how much spending or how, how many drones are they predicting are going to be in the skies in the next few years? If anyone has any information on that. I don't know how many, but I did want to comment on something oh, please, that you just please. said. Uh, I, I think it's very important that we separate the different sizes, and I think that Brendan had started talking about that because I think there's a very big difference between integration of uh, manned aircraft and unmanned aircraft. But I think that there's a lot that can be done to exploit the technology by separating aircraft from manned aircraft and not allowing the risk of the future to control everything that happens today. So I. 
I think that it's unfortunate that the NPRM talks about aircraft as being 55 and under as though it were one lump sum or, or one type of aircraft. I thought they left open the opportunity for small micro UAS. Mm. But I think it's very important to try an incremental approach, a risk-based approach, so that you don't stifle everything because you think that the future could have issues with, the, with integration. Well, I, I agree completely, I, I didn't mean to suggest otherwise. Um, my comment is only that we have to keep in mind that the technology that we're trying to refine now has application far into the future. Uh, I don't disagree with what you just said. I think the, the incremental risk-based approach uh, has a lot of merit. And as you may be aware, in the, the small UAS ARC, the Aviation Rulemaking Committee, recommended a lot more uh, gradation or stratification, if you will, based on size of, of the aircraft. That didn't make it into the NPRM, I think, perhaps as a matter of, of regulatory convenience. I don't know. Uh, we'd have to ask the FAA about that. But yeah, there's a lot of merit, I think, in a, in a uh, crawl, walk, run type of an approach. So we are talking about a really broad variety of size and scale of these aircraft. Uh, the, some of the ones you're talking about further in the future would be the size of the airliners, whereas, as Brendan described before, he still <coughs> describes the unmanned aircraft that a lot of his clients operate as models. Mm -hmm. So th it seems like there's a really broad scale of platforms available there. And uh, I didn't know that, that the, un the, uh, the UAS ARC had recommended a, a, a larger scale or a larger grade eight gradation of, mm -hmm. of regulations based on size. I think DOD has the same kind of thing. I think they, they use, I want to say, five or six different classes based and, on size and weight. I'm not positive. Yeah, and, and other countries have taken that approach. So if you look at Canada, there are currently commercial exemptions in the two kilogram category and the 25 kilogram category. If you look at Australia, I, I think there was also a two, two kilogram proposal. UK, I think, is seven kilograms, and I think France also is two. So but the proposal that, um, that we filed in December um, was in concept to take at least the smallest, lightest category of these things. The one I was flying in this room, which doesn't do anything, but I was flying this around the room, this is half an ounce. And you gotta believe, uh, trust me, I've seen a lot of companies with this technology, everything is getting smaller and lighter and more capable. So yes, there's a 55 pound and up category, but most of the value and the technology that I see out there now and that's coming in the future is small and lightweight and therefore safer and easier, I think, to regulate, especially at low altitudes. So what we proposed is at low altitudes, away from airports, under, say, four or, or five pounds or three pounds if you want to be really conservative, you're basically in a safe area. You're not anywhere near an airliner. There's no airliner that's flying below 500 feet, five miles from an airport. And we also looked at, uh, using Adam Dershowitz's study, he's here from Exponent, uh, he, he did a study for us looking at bird strike data and determined that in the past 25 years, there hasn't been uh, a fatality attributed to a small or medium-sized bird in those locations. So when you're that far away from an airport and that low off the ground and you put a drone in the air, you're basically taking the same risk as the birds that already exist. And there are 10 billion birds in the country. We haven't had a fatality attributed to that kind of scenario. So that's the easy case, and the one that I think should be implemented right away. I don't think we need to wait another. One thing we haven't discussed is that these proposals are gonna take two more years to put into place. There's a comment period. I think we need a final direct rule now on the micro category like many other countries have. Before we cover where the regulations are going, I thought maybe we'd cover where the regulations are right now and where we've been the last few years to, so we understand where we find ourselves today. So uh, I'm, I'm sure those of us that uh, practice aviation law have all, all had that call from a client who says, uh, I don't understand what's going on here. I'm a real estate agent and I bought this little four pound unmanned aircraft, maybe the, uh, the Phantom, the same one Loretta has, and I went out and I took pictures of some of my clients' houses. And I was only flying right over the treetops, I'm only flying right near the houses, yet the FAA sent me a letter, a cease and desist letter, with the threat of a fine. Um, so the client calls an attorney and says, I don't understand, how can the FAA that controls airspace regulate me? How can the FAA tell me what to do when I'm operating over the private property of my client? So let's, 
let's talk about that a little bit. Where, where is this distinction between airspace and private property, and how did that come to uh, formulate a set of regulations where the FAA could send you that letter? I worked for the FAA for 30 years, and I cannot understand <laughs> the rationale <laughs> for how they're regulating uh, UAVs. So I'm probably not the best person to ask because I don't agree with what they've done. But they basically decided that if you operate commercially, or actually that all these model aircraft are aircraft and are to be regulated like manned aircraft. And the manned aircraft rules were never written for these tiny model aircraft. So it, it's a very, very confusing time. And I, and, I, and I feel that these exemptions and the processes that are being used are, are really putting, um, are really hindering the ability of people to comply with the law. And one of the problems that I have is that we only have four or 5,000 inspectors and only a couple of hundred lawyers in the FAA. And they can't spend their time looking at thousands of these little teeny drones when we have huge manned aircraft. Brendan argued some of these issues in the FAA versus Perker case, these issues about FAA authority and, and where airspace begins and ends and what constitutes an aircraft or not. So Brendan, could you fill us in, just give us a background for those who don't know, maybe the short background about the Perker case and some of the arguments you made and that the FAA maybe made against you regarding their authority to regulate unmanned aircraft. Sure, uh, Raphael Perker is one of the pioneers of model aircraft or drone cinematography. He, he was one of the first to go up and, and do first person view uh, flying, which is you've got the video camera on board and you're looking through goggles or a screen and you're flying from the perspective of the drone. Uh, now sort of a very common thing to do. The Phantom is essentially doing that on your phone. Um, and he was asked by the University of Virginia to come and do a commercial shoot in connection with a potential commercial for the medical center. And they planned out the mission, they notified the campus, he got clearance from the helipad at the medical center. Everything was sort of done, I, I would argue, safely. But he's a very uh, experienced and aggressive uh, operator of model aircraft. So if you look at the video, you'll see he's flying over streets and near people and uh, up over buildings and things like that. He's doing stunt flying, it's very dramatic. Um, and so the FAA noticed it, realized you know, this was a commercial video, did some investigations, found out he got paid. And they sent him a proposed penalty and said, this was a, a commercial operation of an unmanned aircraft system, therefore subject to the regulations, and you've, you flew it in a careless or reckless manner in violation of um, Section 9113 of the regulations. Um, what we argued is there was no regulation concerning operation of model aircraft. The FAA had guidelines from 1981 that said voluntary compliance, don't fly above 400 feet, let the Airport, know if you're going to be within three miles. Uh, basically, a set of, of guidance and not actual regulations, which are implemented, as we know at this moment, through notice and comment rulemaking. And we have regulations concerning kites and rockets and balloons, but no model aircraft. So the FAA, I think, was sort of caught um, having to argue that these are just aircraft, even though they've never been regulated for you know, years and decades as aircraft and are subject to the regulations. Um, the, the initial administrative law judge disagreed and dismissed the case, agreed with us that that would be preposterous because then you'd have boomerangs and paper airplanes uh, defined as aircraft subject to regulation. Uh, it went up to the NTSB who reversed and said, well, at least with respect to 9113 careless operation, we're going to say that applies, but we're not going to speak to the issues of commercial operation or anything broader than that. So it was a very narrow um, decision premised on this sort of definition of aircraft. And it didn't deal with the issue Doug raised about airspace and, and, the, and the jurisdiction of the FAA. Because if you look at the statute, there's a concept of navigable airspace. The FAA was put in charge of the airspace in which we travel as, as members of the public. And when you get to a certain lower altitude, as the Supreme Court has held in cases like US versus Cosby, you've got, you're at least bumping up against private property rights. So you've got this notion that a, a property owner owns and controls the airspace surrounding the property. So if I want to put up a flagpole in my backyard, I'm building something into airspace, but I don't have to call the FAA to do it. 
right? The FAA controls navigable airspace above that, the, the airspace that people use to go somewhere or to do something with an aircraft. Um, so we made that argument, but it wasn't decided, and we, we subsequently settled the case uh, for, I think it was $1,100, um, with no admission of, of wrongdoing. So that's sort of the resolution of that case. I think it left a lot of unanswered questions, and, and questions that probably couldn't be answered in the context of that case, because it took place in 2011. His flying was in 2011, and we've since had a statute that people are now uh, debating the meaning of. Could you have made that argument to the FAA that they lack jurisdiction over airspace that's non-navigable and that that surrounding en envelope of private property is not actually navigable airspace and, and is, is usable by the property owner? I, well, not only do I, well, I made the argument, so I obviously think it could be made because I only make arguments that I think are in good faith. So yes, I, I think that, I mean, if you go back historically to the beginning of the country and you think about airspace, traditionally the homeowner, the property owner, owned it all the way to the heavens. It was called ad coelum, right? It was, it was a property right, just like mineral rights. Uh, airplanes came along in the 20s, and all of a sudden the country needed to figure out how to get around what was a trespassing problem, right? You'd have aircraft flying across somebody's property, through the property, that was a trespass. You could get an injunction, you could pursue damages, even if they're nominal damages, you could shut down the emerging airplane industry. Very similar to what's happening now with this drone stuff, right? We have privacy laws we're going to talk about that I think are connected to this concept of private property, private ownership of airspace. So what did Congress do to get around this problem of trespass by aircraft. Well, they couldn't just seize the property from everyone under the Fifth Amendment. That requires just compensation and everyone has a right of appeal. So all of a sudden you'd have, you'd have to identify all the property owners across the country, pay them, and then give them a right to, to appeal. It would be a, a real mess. You couldn't just ignore this doctrine of, of ad coelum that you had property rights because you had cases on the books saying property, you know, neighbors who build into your airspace can be forced to take it down. So you had a real legal dilemma, including in this, I think, very building. There are people in the 20s who, in the New York Bar Associations, who wrestled with this problem. Eventually, Congress said, all right, we're going to provide a right of, of transit through navigable airspace, basically like an easement. So as a member of the public, you can transit through that space. You're not really occupying it. You're not using it. It's so long as it's above, na above sort of a, a certain point. In other words, navigable airspace, as defined by the minimum safe altitude of an aircraft. So as much airspace as the airplanes need to operate safely, that's what the government has given to us as an easement to travel through. And they didn't address what happens you know, one or two feet above the ground. When you get to the Cosby case, which is the chicken farm case, the airplanes flying over the, the coop, and the Cosby sued the US government, and the Supreme Court said, yeah, that's right, there's navigable airspace, there's a, there's a highway in the sky, but when you get down to a low level, and in that case it was 83 feet, there's still property rights. And you know, if you're, if you're the government and you're flying through it constantly, you're taking that or you're trespassing. So you still have this notion that there's something that may still belong to, to it. And if you look at the FAA's um, sort of enabling statute, you'll see that it refers to naval airspace. It doesn't just say FAA controls everything to do with the air or even the airspace. It says naval airspace, and that's defined as minimum safe altitude, which in most places uh, is 500 feet or in some places 1,000 feet. So yes, Doug, I, I think there's an argument that could be made and was not resolved in that case and, and might need uh, sort of more of a property owner framework to, to truly be uh, tackled uh, that turns on that point. How high did Raphael Perker fly that aircraft that he was flying at the University of Virginia? Was he still in an area where you could argue he's on private property? I, most of the flying, yes. I, th I think if the point was to fly sort of at low altitudes over the buildings. Uh, there was an allegation that he was higher than 400 feet, but I, you know, there's, there was no factual investigation as to what actual altitude he was at. And yet the FAA asserted against your client, even though most of it happened below navigable airspace, that they still had the authority to not only regulate his operation, but that they had the authority to um, come after him for a violation of those regulations. Right, and I think Loretta would, would tell you that the FAA will, will assert jurisdiction down to the ground. So if you, if you mow your lawn, you're giving the FAA an extra inch, right? <laughs> and, 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 and if you dig a hole, you get, you know, maybe you're giving them a few But I mean, in, in a manned aircraft, if you operated so low, you, it wouldn't be a way of getting out of a regulatory violation to say that they operated so low so that you can't prosecute them. So. But at that point, you would have created the hazard that 9113 was supposed to address. Uh, endangering the life or property of another on the ground. Right. I'm just saying that the fact that it was 
at low altitudes wouldn't be the, the argument that they don't have jurisdiction. But the, but the issue of property rights also comes up in terms of private operation, and, and it happens to be a, something that I care about because as much as I love my drone, I don't love yours. And, <laughs> and I do feel very strongly that I don't want other people's drones at low altitude over my property. So I do think that the issue of property rights is going to become a very big issue because even if it's not a privacy issue, it could be a trespass issue. At, at what altitude should you or could you fly without it being a, uh, a trespass? So then if someone is trespassing, and this is hypothetical, I don't think it's happened yet, what rights would a property owner have if, if indeed someone with a, a drone was <coughs> so low that they were trespassing on property? Uh, I, I think I saw in the news a couple of years ago this Deer Trail Colorado actually is, issued drone hunting permits. <laughs> No, I don't think they actually that? ever did. did they? No, they decided not to. <laughs> oh. There's a lot of news about that, though. So where does that leave us as far as the current state of regulations uh, for unmanned aircraft operations right now? So we have this notice of proposed rulemaking, but that's not in place yet. What, what's the current framework for unmanned aircraft operators right now? Well, I'll take that one. Um, I, I think pending the, uh, the enactment of, of, of a rule, we're, we're living in now is, is, is a sort of a limbo world. And again, if you'd asked me that um, a year ago, before the appeal on the Perfect decision, I might have given you a different answer. But now, if I get the call from a client, uh, the real estate example that you gave, um, you know, I think that whereas a year ago I might have uh, told him he had a little more leeway, now with the, the full board of the NTSB deciding what exactly is an aircraft, um, I think operators have to, uh, especially com a commercial operators, so I'm, I'm speaking about now, have to operate under the assumption that they're being uh, regulated. And the process, the, the, the world we live in now is that before a rule comes down, anyone who wants to operate commercially, uh, a, a private entity, has to seek an exemption from the FAA. Um, call them Section 333 exemptions based on the provision of the code in the uh, uh, FAA Modernization and Reform Act. And it's basically uh, any real estate agent who wants to operate a drone to take pictures of a house uh, or a film company or an agricultural operator has to submit a request to the FAA asking to be exempted from certain provisions of the federal aviation regulations. If, uh, typically, they're the regulations governing airworthiness requirements, um, annual inspections and such, and then they get, hopefully, I think, what, 60 operators or something have been getting is more than that now? Uh, over 100. 200 so, okay. more than that. Well, it's, and it's, it's quickly growing. It, there were seven when I was on my last panel six months ago or something like that. Now we're over 200, and uh, the FAA will give authority for an operator to conduct operations under very tight restrictions, tighter restrictions than actually we're talking about in this notice of proposed rulemaking. Um, typically with the film companies, for example, we saw uh, it had to be operated during daylight hours uh, on closed movie sets. Uh, the operator had to have a private pilot certificate at a minimum and also a medical uh, uh, from an FAA uh, uh, medical inspector. Um, there had to be, I think, three visual observers. Uh, <coughs> onerous requirements, to say the least. And that's, that's the world we're operating in now. I think recently the FAA said that anybody who has an exemption has automatic uh, authority to operate up to 200 feet. Is that right, Brandon? Or? Well, the, the, so it, even once you get your exemption with all those conditions and requirements and the pilot license requirement, you still, uh, under the first exemptions, you needed to contact FAA for every single operation to get what's called a certificate of authorization for the airspace. So it was like, and that, people were saying to me, it took three weeks to get that. So you, you get a call for a TV commercial, you got to call the FAA to do the operation. They've since said that if you are flying no higher than 200 feet, you don't need to ask for that. It's a blanket authorization for airspace. So all of this is legacy of, of manned aircraft framework trying to be you know, placed on the unmanned right. on the drones. And, and that would apply for uh, operating a drone that size commercially right now. Yeah, that, that was this, my next question. This doesn't have any... Ben mentioned... That, that these are commercial operations, and that brings up an interesting point. 
the same, so you're the same drone doing the same work as a hobby, if there's no money involved, is categorized and regulated differently, even though it's operating in the same airspace doing the same thing. Could you explain that? Well, uh, I mean, there are really, <laughs> I was going to, to say that there's bizarre disincentives to complying with the law because right now the FAA has never prosecuted anyone for commercial operation, even though clearly there's a lot of people operating commercially, some very openly operating commercially. At the same time, the path to legalization has been through an exemption process that is so onerous that all but the biggest companies could really comply with it. So the real estate agent that got the first exemption in Tucson had 33 requirements. So I don't know how much money you make in Tucson as a real estate agent, but I can't imagine that hiring a, at that time, a private pilot, a visual observer, because you needed a visual observer, you still need that, and a pilot certificate. Now you could have a sport pilot or a recreational certificate. And filing the, uh, the NOTAM and the uh, certificate of authorization. On top of that, you have to stay 500 feet from any structure, person, vehicle, or vessel not affiliated or associated with the operation. You have to have a manual. I mean, there's so many requirements that I don't really think that any, anyone other than a large company could comply. So as a former regulator, I, I don't see what the incentive to get a 333 is if the FAA isn't prosecuting you when you don't have it. So it's, it's, to me, it's a very bizarre situation to put people in. And it creates a class of people that uh, don't uh, believe in the FAA as a regulatory authority. And I think that sets up a very bad precedent in terms of air safety if people don't respect the authority of the FAA. Brendan, did you have a comment about that distinction between hobby and commercial? Sure. I, I've been a hobbyist for over 20 years with uh, model aircraft. So, you know, it, my perspective is that the, those devices were not regulated. They were not regulated as aircraft. Trying to regulate them now, after the fact, as aircraft. The reason you need the exemption and, all, and to jump through all these hoops is that it's an aircraft, so suddenly everything applies and, has, and you have to exempt yourself or the FDA has to exempt you from things like, believe it or not, having your, your aircraft manual in the cockpit, right? It doesn't make any sense for a drone to have a manual up there when you're on the ground, but that's, that's one of the exemptions you need. Um, uh, and, and there are lots of others, seat belts, and I, you, know, you can't fly at night, all sorts of things. Um, so, you know, what, what's going on with the hobby exception? A couple things. First, I think they were never regulated in the first place. Now, I think the FAA would say, well, they were always regulated, but we kind of looked the other way. We provided sort of a discretionary non-enforcement or something like that. I don't think it makes sense, but that's, what they pro that's probably the best thing they could say today about what's going on. Congress in 2012 um, protected the model aircraft hobbyists by putting in a provision into that, into that Modernization and Reform Act that said, if you've got a hobbyist who's flying for recreational purposes pursuant to community-based organization uh, guidelines or set of programming, then don't, you, can't, you can't regulate those people. You can't create new regulations uh, for the hobbyists. Why did they do that? Because there was this thriving, and, and continues to be a thriving community of model aircraft enthusiasts, uh, hundreds of thousands of them, represented by the Academy of Model Aeronautics, one of my clients, as it turns out. Uh, they've been around 80 years, they have safety guidelines, an amazing safety record, and guess what? Now, like a million people have drones now, and I still have yet to hear of a, of a serious incident with a, with a multi-rotor, like a Phantom, uh, let alone a fatality. So these are safe devices that I think have been operated safely pursuant to community-based guidelines for decades, and Congress recognized that and said, don't regulate those guys when you are putting in place the unmanned aircraft regulations. And so they're protected, although the FAA has narrowly construed the statute in various ways I don't need to get into right now um, to kind of limit what it means to be uh, a hobbyist or to be flying for recreational purposes and there are some other provisions. And the FAA has said, even if you're in that category, if you're doing something unsafe, we could still take enforcement action under any of the aviation regulations. So they're almost ignoring uh, Congress, if, if you will, um, even though it says you shouldn't do that. 
So let's, let's use that as a jumping off point to where the regulations are going uh, moving forward. So you mentioned that in 2012, Congress passed the FAA Modernization and Reform Act, and it was in that act that for the very first time, Congress mandated that the FAA do something about regulating and integrating unmanned aircraft into the national airspace system. So why don't we talk a little bit about some of the provisions of that act and how much progress we've made so far on that. And anyone who's familiar, I think Loretta probably has a fair background in that. How much progress we've made? <laughs> well, let's start with the act. Could you, for anyone in the audience that's not familiar with some of the provisions in the act telling the FAA to integrate, what, what, what did they, what did Congress task the FAA with doing? Well, I, I think that, um, and I, I haven't read the uh, the statute in in a while. Um, the provisions for the model aircraft we talked about, and the and Congress told the FAA that if in the interim uh, there was a safe way or certain models that could be operated safely, then the FAA should take action to allow those. And that's what these 333 exemptions were supposed to do. Um, I, I don't see that the FAA has been acting very quickly since 2012. It took until February of this year to get a draft out, and it's unlikely. People talk about two or three years, but in the agency, we always talked about significant rulemaking being a minimum of 10 years. And I like to tell people about the repair station rule, which took an astounding 24 years. And the first iteration had to be uh, rescinded because the technology advanced to the point where the the regulation no longer served its intended purpose. So people who think two or three years, I think to myself, no way, unless Congress intervenes and mandates the specific regulatory requirements that would then allow the FAA to issue a direct final rule. So we're not going to see a rule. I would be shocked if we saw a rule out of the FAA in under the, the standard 10 years. Um, but Loretta, hasn't it been 10 years? I, my understanding is they, they, the agency started this process, even though they weren't mandated by Congress to do it, but started to look at unmanned aircraft systems in around 2005. So we're really, you're at the 10-year mark already. Right, but the NPRM has only been out since February. So you, you think it might take 10 years from now to put something in, in place? I would be shocked if it took less than that, but you have wow. experience with FAA rulemaking. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I think your point's well taken, Loretta, that it does tend to be ponderous, and you know better than all of us probably that that's a, a largely a matter of, of staffing and just being able to process the, the volume of paperwork that goes on. Uh, I'm a little more optimistic than, than you are, only because I think it's such a high visibility, high priority item, but I, I would be surprised if it took less than several years. Uh, I'm not, that, that's unfortunate in one respect in that as several people have pointed out, what's going on out there now is people operating in a vacuum and in, in the limbo state uh, that we talked about, there's, there isn't a rule and so people tend to make it up as they go along uh, up to and including the, the NTSB based on a you know, case by case basis. Uh, so it's unfortunate in that respect, but by the same token, uh, we at ALPA anyway don't, don't want to see rapid rulemaking for the sake of expediency. Uh, I think history shows us that when we, when we act too quickly in aviation, bad things can happen. So there's a balance to be struck there, I think. Uh, and and I, don't, I don't know that the FAA, they have the talent, I don't know that they have the staffing. Uh, we feel like they did a pretty good job in the NPRM in terms of being on the right track, but clearly, uh, they, they don't have the, the staff resources to process what was yesterday um, was 3,600 comments to the docket. Uh, and those are all going to have to be adjudicated one way or another. 
Let's well, talk about that in NPRM. Yeah, actually, so, I think the FAA did a, a surprising job on the NPRM. I mean, you can pick apart things, and, and then I don't agree with all of it, but I was like so shocked that it was as liberal as it was. And I, and I did think that for the FAA, it was a really good start. Unfortunately, knowing the history of how long everything takes, that's the part that's dismaying. But um, I think there were a lot of really good things. For example, not requiring an airworthiness certificate is, is huge because that allows, uh, or a type certificate, that allows uh, rapid uh, development of new technology without having to get everything approved. Not requiring a pilot certificate, I think, is, is significant, although, of course, requiring a pilot certificate is completely absurd. But um, some of us thought that that might carry over into the rule. So I thought there were a lot of, of good things. I, I don't agree with uh, not allowing night flying. Um, a lot of these uh, drones are actually a lot easier to see at night. And other countries have much more reasonable regulations, I think. Like New Zealand allows night flights as long as the drone is at an altitude below structures, which makes a lot of sense because if you have an airplane below structures, you have a much bigger problem than the drone. Um, so there's a lot of countries that we could be learning from that have been doing this for a lot longer, and we should be looking to what they did and why they did it and, and incorporating it into to what we do. So just to set the stage, though, to, to when we're talking about this NPRM, we're talking about this notice of proposed rulemaking that came out in February for anyone who's not familiar with the small unmanned aircraft field. In February, the FAA finally published a notice of proposed rulemaking that proposes regulations to govern the operations of unmanned aircraft that are 55 pounds and under. And there were a list of proposals for the criteria that these aircraft would have to meet in order to be able to operate. So uh, does anyone have a, a outline or just uh, talking points about some of the, Loretta mentioned them, so it's daytime only? Right, daytime only, line of sight, no more than 100 miles per hour. Um, but it doesn't require an observer. It does require an operator certificate. That's uh, an airman certificate, but not a pilot certificate. No medical. Uh, I think you have to have a valid driver's license. No operations in uh, controlled airspace, meaning Bravo, Charlie, B, C, or D. Uh, or E around an airport without ATC's prior permission. Um, operations in G below 500 feet without ATC's prior permission. I G's like uncontrolled airspace, not near airports, just Chris, you weren't on the ARC, but I know that probably was a point of contention about even with prior permission, do you think it's feasible that you'll see, let's say, in Class B or Class B airspace, some of these, uh, some of these aircraft? Operating. Well, I hope not. Uh, I think the, the concern that we have is, is as much practical as anything else. When you, when you look at the NPRM and it says it can be operated in class B, C, or D with prior ATC permission, but there, there aren't any guidelines on how you get that permission and what ATC is supposed to do. So I, I think we're not quite there yet. Uh, Part of the NPRM was a request by the FAA to comment on a, on a 333 petition. Uh, now, I don't recall the petitioner's name offhand, but even, you know, even in their petition, they said, we don't think it's appropriate to operate in other than Class G airspace at this time. Uh, and I, I think that's very, it's, a, it's an important point, the at this time part. Uh, there's not a lot of data out there on which to base good uh, hazard evaluation, risk assessment types of decisions. So I, we would certainly advocate uh, not not being operated in controlled airspace at this point. I just don't think the data is there to support the safety case. Um, I I, it, just, I disagree. I mean, the, the data has been there for decades. We we've got model aircraft clubs that have been operating in Class B airspace for decades safely here in Brooklyn at Floyd Bennett Field, about five miles from JFK. Uh, you've got another club uh, in the same location. We're in Class B airspace right now. If I step outside and fly this out in the sidewalk, technically down to the surface in most of New York City, it's 
Class B airspace, right. even though I'm between buildings. So but, I think there, there are easy use cases, even in Class B, for drone technology. Well, two, two things come to mind, uh, and I understand what you're saying, but for one thing, absence of an accident is not, by definition, safety. Uh, those are two separate quantities. Uh, and we're also, we gotta remember that the, we're, in the NPRM, we're talking about commercial use, uh, not hobby use with, as you mentioned, AMA, superb set of safety guidelines, no argument there. Uh, and not only that, an incentive uh, when, it's, when it's your baby, uh, there's a lot of incentive to operate it intelligently, safely, conservatively. Whereas if, if it's a business expense, uh, and you write it off when it crashes, that's a different mindset. So, uh, you know, I, I think it's still, we still have to keep in mind that the data for commercial operation, uh, the potential for uh, failures of different systems, uh, as, the air, as the aircraft get more and more sophisticated, it opens up a whole world of how do we evaluate the potential for failure of those systems. So you, you when, make a good point. And so things will go wrong with yeah. these and there are some I risks mean, there. You, you know as well as I do, Doug, uh, air, airplanes are operate are built, designed, certified, tested, based on, among other things, loss of an engine and being able to safely continue the flight. If you look at an octocopter out there, uh, I'd like somebody to tell me what its engine out operation characteristics are. What's it gonna do when one of those motors quits? An octocopter? Or a quadcopter. A oh, quad may be a problem, but an octo will typically stay, you know, use the other seven motors to stay up. But look, I, I agree that you need a safety set of guidelines like the AMAs, but the real question is, do we need something more burdensome than that, more complicated, more bureaucracy? You know, does it make it safer? For example, the NPRM says you have to register your aircraft. So you have to take this and get a tail number for the aircraft, and you have to go through a Homeland Security, one of the the list of checklist items, Homeland Security background check. Okay, a hobbyist doesn't need to do that, but somehow if you're flying for business purpose with the same equipment that you can buy off the shelf, you need a background check and Homeland Security. Maybe you get flagged for some you know, technical reason. You can't do it. So there, there are, you know, I, I agree with you 100% that we need to be safe about the technology, especially near airports, absolutely. But the notion that you could never operate in Class B or could never think of a reasonable framework to allow people to do that, I think, is, is just not true. We, we, we have had people doing it, and I, you know, I'm a model aircraft operator. The, the, yes, people are safe, but, and they're building it themselves, and they care about their baby, that's true, uh, but that's not true for everyone. And you know, I think if you have commercial operators with expensive camera equipment on board, arguably they're taking more precautions than your typical hobbyist who's just gluing things together in the garage. So, I don't really know that that's, that generalization is necessarily true. Yeah, I, I think that this argument sort of highlights this, the, the problems with the distinction between hobbyist and commercial. Because if it's a safety issue, if it's really a safety issue to operate in Class B airspace uh, below 500 feet, it should be a safety issue regardless of whether what your purpose is for operating. I mean, I, I guess I can take your point to some degree, Chris, but um, I think, and you see that flow throughout these rules, that the distinction between hobbyist and commercial operator, um, if you're addressing the concerns that the FAA claims um, they're motivated by, safety, national security, uh, they don't tend to make a lot of sense because certainly in the national security realm, the concerns you'd have there, it's almost certainly the person who would be operating a drone with some sort of hostile intent towards an aircraft would be doing so as a hobbyist or under a hobbyist uh, yeah. <laughs> guideline, <clears throat> well, as defined by the FAA, right? And not as a commercial operator. Okay. Well, that, that's a fair point, but you know, the, the question we're talking about is the NPRM, and for good or ill, it's limited to commercial operation. I, I agree with you that uh, there's a valid case to be made for saying, why do we regulate the same airplane differently based on whether somebody's getting paid or not? Uh, but. You know, you made a great point about the, the octocopter, and your comment, if I recall correctly, was that it's, it's going to rely on the other seven motors. One of the questions that we have when we look at the NPRM is why is that, is that always going to happen? As this field begins to explode, as it already has, and more, there are more and more entrants into building and operating UAS, uh, 
there are no design standards. There's nothing that says it has to be able to safely fly on the remaining seven motors or the remaining three motors or whatever it is. Uh, should it go through a whole FAR Part 21 certification? No, I mean, that, that would be gross overkill. Hey, but, but there are no standards that, uh, that someone who goes out and buys parts in, in a kit can use to build something and ensure that it's built safely and can operate under various conditions of failure or normal operation. I mean, I think it was surprising that the same rules that apply to a two pound drone would apply to a 55 pound drone. Quite honestly, I'm unless comfortable with 55 pound drones having the same requirements. And, and I was surprised by that, which I'm not sure whether that was uh, done to slow the process down or to speed it up. Um, because you create a lot more controversy by having the drones all regulated in the same manner. But to the, to the commercial versus the um, hobby, New Zealand actually tackled that issue in an NPRM that it issued recently or in the last few months. And it talked about the distinction between regulations for commercial and hobby not really holding up when you're talking about unmanned aircraft. I mean, traditionally, the reason for having the distinction is because you're carrying people and you're car carrying cargo for compensation. You don't have that same impetus to differentiate the rules. And in fact, uh, New Zealand doesn't have a difference between their uh, hobby and their commercial. I think what they're proposing is to have a distinction for over two kilos. So there, there are technologies that are being developed and, and that, could, that could be incorporated into some of these aircraft that could mitigate some of the risks we're talking about. And, and one of the ones we've heard about is geofencing, where you can hard code the, the onboard software to either keep it locked into a specific area or locked out of another area. Um, is, is that a possibility? Is that something that the, the rulemaking committees have discussed? What about these technologies? Well, I think. The rulemaking committees, I would assume, have discussed that. I know we've, we've made some comments in those regards. Uh, and if you recall, when the, uh, the Phantom landed on the White House lawn, the DJI people came out with a press release or some sort of communication that said they were going to build that capability into their aircraft. Now, whether they did or not, I don't know. You guys might know better than I. I think they said uh, that last farmer. And so that raises the question, though, just like, you know, any kind of software on all kinds of airplanes these days, how do you, if, if it's supposed to do that, how do you know that it does? Is it tamper-proof? Is it tamper-resistant? Uh, those kinds of questions. And I'm, I'm not advocating one or the other, but I think those are all questions that need to be addressed, and it gets to this notion of some sort of standards against which a UAS can be built so that it, it's safe operation is reasonably assured. So Jay, from a, from a civil rights point of view, what would the ACLU say about hardware that's delivered that either has software embedded in it to keep unmanned aircraft out of areas or the potential to have software beamed in from outside to control someone else's property? What, what? Yeah, so I wrote a blog post about this uh, post in the last couple of days. Um, uh, keying off the announcement by the, um, the maker of the drone that landed in the White House tree uh, that they were gonna geofence theirs. And um, you know, there are competing interests here. Again, um, you know, we believe in the freedom to tinker. We think that people should have control over their own technology. On the other hand, uh, you know, there, are, there are good reasons to regulate uh, drones just as we regulate cars. Um, uh, ideally, any, and, and certainly like, if you talk about like, the government or a big company putting controls into your technology that can raise some spooky ideas of you know robot armies snapping to life or whatever. If like they, you know they 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 they're going to program in the White House. Okay, nobody would disagree with that. They're going to program in certain military bases, Area 51. What else are they going to add to the list? Um, they're going to put in you know on the fly. They're going to be able to put things on the fly so that the police are are rioting against rioters. That that suddenly no drones will be able to fly in that area. Um, or what have you. So there's certainly, you know, when you when you talk about centralized technical control, be able to put code into you know thousands or millions of, of products, there, there's there is potential for abuse there. Um, and ideally, any kind of centralized control like that would be 
um, visible, open source, um, you know, uh, minimal, um, and, and, and to, the, to the greatest extent possible, leave control of, of technology to the user. Um, and this is something that applies to not drones, but, but, but potentially lots of other technologies. Um, for example, Apple got a patent on, uh, on a technology that would allow the police, for example, to shut down the camera and, and transmit functions of any cell phone within a certain radius. Um, and, uh, you know, in the wake of Ferguson, for example, where we saw widespread attempts by the police to shut down photographers, they arrested photographers, to order people to stop photographing, and they got from the FAA a tempor temporary shutdown of the airspace um, around Ferguson, which seemed based not on, to us not based on uh, safety, but on a, again a desire to um, to shut down aerial journalism. Um, so these are some of the issues that we think about when when we think about um, geofencing. Um, and if geofencing is going to be done, then it should be done through a transparent process with checks and balances. Um, and, um, and transparent should go not just to the decisions that are made, but also to the code that implements it, because there can be a lot of mischief um, hidden inside code. Why don't we cover some of these privacy issues that uh, we see a lot in the media? The, um, there is a lot of public concern about the use of drones, either by uh, public entities, police forces, other in investigative branches of government uh, using drones for ways that would be considered violations of Fourth Amendment uh, search and seizure rights. There also, there's also a concern on the private side that unmanned aircraft could be used as uh, almost a peeping Tom tool. So. Uh, Maybe you could get us started on some sure. of Sure. Uh, I'll just throw out some thoughts. Um, it's a very wide subject. Um, and again, we've called for the regulation of police use of drones. And in fact, there's been a somewhat amazing uprising within state legislatures around the country to uh, address uh, drones and the privacy issues raised thereby. I mean, as a, you know, in 14 years as a privacy advocate, I've seen nothing like it. Um, I wish that uh, you know, equivalent attention would be paid to, to, to pr privacy issues that are sort of more present in some ways more significant. But um, uh, you know the, the issues potentially raised by drones are potentially significant down the road, um, uh, and I think that um, you know we don't know what they're going to be in the commercial space. Uh, you know the, the nightmare scenario would be, for example, and this would be technologically possible, would be a company like Google sets up live Google Earth, right? So instead of being able to look at a satellite photo of your house or your building, now you can look at a real-time aerial feed. Not only that, but when you walk out or when you drive out from that, wherever you go, the, 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 the route that you take and all of your destinations are, are tracked and logged into databases and stored for decades so that if you, for some reason, come to somebody's attention down the road, they can hit rewind in your life, they can see all of your associations, uh, religious, sexual, uh, political meetings or institutions that you've gone to, medical institutions, et cetera. So, I mean, uh, location privacy is a very, very rich, sensitive set of data about us, and yet, um, you know, that, that would be a potential nightmare scenario, either from the government side or the corporate side. Um, but we do know that, that, that it's going to be inevitable that police forces are going to want to use drones. Um, and we've already seen some uh, mayors and others uh, make attempts to, you know, there was a mayor of Ogden, Utah, who wanted to put a blimp up over a neighborhood and just videotape the entire neighborhood 24-7 and track everybody. Um, that got shot down very quickly by the FAA. That was his, that was his plan. Um, and so that's why we think that it is reasonable to put restrictions in place on, on, the, on the government side, but, but not on the, on the, uh, on the corporate side. Um, there are existing laws that would come into play on privacy, especially you know, on, the, on, the, on the privacy side. There, there are the privacy torts. There's um, you know, trespass law, nuisance law. And there are most states, all the states have keeping Tom laws, which would pretty clearly cover, for example, a drone hovering up on third, looking into a third floor bedroom window. Um, that would also pretty be clearly already covered by the Fourth Amendment if the police were to do that. Um, and uh, what's not clear, again, is, is if you're being tracked everywhere you're going in public. Um, and that's a difficult issue because, uh, you know, you don't have any privacy expectation in public, people say. But that's, not, that's overly simplistic because we now have technologies that can track you for weeks on end, where I think most people, if they were being followed around by somebody, including a police officer, for weeks on end would object. 
Um, and the Supreme Court has begun to grapple with those issues in the Jones decision, which uh, had to do with GPS trackers on cars. Um, so, uh, so yeah, there's 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 a there's some things to throw out there to get us started. So, regarding some of the state legislation that occurred in the last few years, where states have passed laws against their own public entities being able to use unmanned aircraft, some of those uh, state laws go pretty far in that they say, for example, I, I don't remember the state, for example, but it said it might have been Florida that passed one that said that a state entity or sub-state entity could only operate an unmanned aircraft if either A, they had a warrant, or B, there was an emergency. Um, and obviously, in talking about Fourth Amendment protections before, that goes much farther than any other restriction on what a, what a police department or other uh, investigative agency could do. Um, so do you think rules like that are warranted with unmanned aircraft? Because of the nature of the unmanned aircraft, do you think some of these legislatures maybe went a little too far in somewhat of a knee-jerk reaction? And I'm, obviously, I'm going to let everyone else answer that one too. Well, I'll, sure, I'll start. Um, I mean, what we called for in the paper that I wrote, co-wrote in, in 2010, was was that you know, the police not um, not fly drones unless they had reason to believe that it would good reasons to believe that it would collect information about criminal wrongdoing. Um, what we were aiming at is, is, is to try to stop sort of mass surveillance, uh, suspicionless surveillance. Um, a lot of the state legislatures, and we, you know, our lobbyists working in all the 50 state legislatures, um, uh, you know, took that uh, and, and, and basically, um, yeah, imposed warrant requirements on the police for flying of a drone. Um, and there, there, prob that there will probably be circumstances in which that is too far. I mean, for example, I mean, you might want police to be able to use it to uh, photograph an accident scene or what have you. Um, but, you, you know, I mean, usually what we deal with with new technologies is they arrive like that, the police don't even tell, don't even tell anybody about them, let alone ask permission. We've seen this, for example, with license plate readers. And the next thing you know, there are facts on the ground and police are using them everywhere. And then we try and, like, deal with that, that reality and back things up and try and put in some place some privacy protections, and it's very, very hard. So you know what, if, if, if one time the privacy protections go in place first, and maybe we have to back up the privacy protections a little bit because they're a little too, too you know, does it have to be, is it such a bad thing if, if you know, the privacy protections are put in place first? Um, I would argue not. There are certainly, you know, look, there's 50 states, there's a bell curve, some of the legislation is very bad. For example, Texas, which, you know, very broadly bans, uh, you know, photography from, from drones. Um, and there's, you know, and none of it's perfect. But, um, but that's kind of my general, our general view on, on, on that. Brennan, I, I was curious about your thoughts about your, for Texas EquiSearch, for example, they think that at least a government entity acting as a first responder seeking to locate uh, someone in a search and rescue effort might find some of those state efforts to have gone a little bit too far. Right, so Texas EquiSearch is a volunteer nonprofit. It's not a government agency. They obviously work in cooperation with the government because when you're searching for someone who's missing, you can't just you know, go where you please and not coordinate with emergency workers. Um, I, I do think many of the states have gone way too far sort of in a, in a knee-jerk reaction. Uh, never mind the warrant requirements, states like Virginia have imposed moratoriums and said no government agency, no state agency shall use a drone, period, through 2015. Um, and they're one of, I think, about two or three states that have gone that far. So there's new technology, it might be useful to taxpayers, might be beneficial in, in car accident uh, investigations. You're taking a picture from overhead, it's not, there's no privacy right there, it's a crime scene, cameras everywhere. For some reason, this technology is the one that's singled out and you can't use it. Even though we know aerial photography, we've had aerial photography for, for a long time. And we've had Supreme Court decisions that have said you don't have a reasonable expectation of privacy from aerial photography uh, taken where aircraft fly, right? So like Florida versus Riley. We have decisions, Fourth Amendment decisions, on this very point. So the question in my mind is, what is the difference? If the person is on the ground, the pilot controlling it is on the ground versus in the cockpit, but the aircraft, let's call it an aircraft for this purpose at least, is in the same location doing the same thing, what is, why do you need a warrant for that? Why do you want the police to go get a warrant? Now, I understand this, the persistent surveillance, following people, tracking. That. I think that's a different category. But for the most part, these devices are going to be extremely useful to, to save taxpayer dollars, to 
help save the lives of police officers, and yes, to gather evidence in, in crimes, which I think is a, is a good public function as well. When it, when it gets over to things like the drone is in a place where aircraft don't normally fly, or is, is doing something like gathering persistent surveillance data, like GPS, the substitute for GPS tracking. I can see that, but if you look at all the legislation across the country, I don't think any of it is like that. The, the bill in California that was vetoed by the governor about four months ago uh, would have required a warrant uh, by police for just about anything except an emergency. So traffic accident photos would have fallen into the warrant uh, requirement, uh, crime scene, uh, uh, I think search and rescue was, was set aside, but for the most part, I think the states are just not thinking through the beneficial uses of the technology that don't implicate privacy concerns. I guess I guess um, I would make two points. Number one, on the Virginia moratorium, I mean, that was passed in like 2013 or whatever. I mean, there were like six police departments around the country who were using drones, who had COAs, the COAs, at that point. Um, and, and, you know, and if we, I think there were like 17 or 18,000 police law enforcement agencies in the U.S. So it wasn't like a radical step, um, but you know, wh whatever. Um, I, I do think that you, you know there is a difference between drones and manned aircraft, and that is that manned aircraft are very, very expensive. They're, they you have to hire a ground crew, maintenance, a, a multi-million dollar aircraft, um, crew in shifts, et cetera, and that imposes a natural limit on the amount of aerial surveillance that's going to be done. Whereas we're looking at a future where you know you could get a police police agency could get hundreds of thirty dollar drones and fly them continuously over a city very very easily, um, and what we see with with surveillance technology is that when it becomes cheap and easy, it tends to be overused. So I think there are very legitimate reasons to think, and when you look at the history of, of police departments and surveillance, there are legitimate reasons to think that at least some police departments would over would overuse them for mass suspicionless surveillance, and that's what I think that the, the intent was to stop with these warrant requirements. Um, so, yeah. Of course, another difference is that manned aircraft are typically much louder and announce themselves in a much different way than, than an -air, unmanned aircraft would. But one point I think to make, because I think there's some misconception on this, is that the FAA has no mandate whatsoever in the, pri in the privacy arena, uh, nor any desire uh, to regulate in the privacy uh, arena. And they said as much in the notice of proposed rulemaking, you know, go look to your state laws and other local uh, and other uh, lawmaking agencies. We're, we're not involved in, in the privacy uh, aspect of this. Now, that being said, I think that with some of the overreaching state regulations, once there is a rule out there, they may bump up against um, some portions of that rule, and then we'll have some preemption issues out there in terms of what states, because states aren't only regulating law enforcement agencies when it's privacy, but They've also passed laws about what general citizens can do with drugs as well. And I think then there could be some tension with whatever rule does come out, um, whether or not the FAA's you know, regulations in this area preempt state laws and some of the more um, overreaching privacy uh, rules by the state. Let's, let's talk about the rules a little beyond privacy. We'll take some audience questions on privacy a little bit. Let's talk about uh, terrorism and, and national security and the potential for misuse of unmanned aircraft. It's obvious to, to everyone that unmanned aircraft could potentially be used for nefarious purposes. Things, people could use them to do really bad things. Uh, they could use an anthrax-laden uh, unmanned aircraft to, to, to sprinkle an outdoor event. I, I didn't know anything about the, the uh, tear gas one. Uh, I'd never heard that before. Pepper so, spray. So, or pepper spray. So, so what, are, what are the panel's opinions on that, about what to do about the potential for, for harm to be done using unmanned aircraft? Well, it's certainly frightening to think of what can be done with, with drones, but um, with all new technology and actually with some pretty low tech we've seen that uh, people that want to do harm can, can use all kinds of technology and, and not so sophisticated technology to do harm. But my concern is that that not drive every decision on what to do with drones and the positives of drones. Plus I see, and, and I'm asked the question all the time about um, when bad things happen. 
but there hasn't been any impetus, and I'm not suggesting that there be one, to stop the importation of drones or the sale of drones. So the question of uh, when bad things happen, it's not whether or not they're regulated, it's whether or not you can find the people and stop them before they use different instruments. Yeah, I, I guess I just, you know, this one, I don't mean to be cavalier about it, but um, I, I don't see regulations um, getting in the way of somebody who's committed to using a drone for a terrorist act. And, you know, there's lots of other devices out there, such as guns, <laughs> um, that I'm much more worried about than uh, at least uh, drones of a certain size. Um, so, you know, regulation can do lots of of good things for safety, I don't see how, uh, you know, the cat's sort of out of the bag on the technology. Drones are out there. People can buy them on the internet. They can make them themselves. Um, someone who wants to use a drone, not that I think it's the best device, but uh, to, to carry out some sort of terrorist act is gonna find a way, uh, regulations, um, you know, or not. So, again, not to be cavalier, but I, in my mind, there's lots of more worrying technologies out there, some which were developed centuries ago. Terrorists their hands there, there, there's this technology that's used like in like 90% of bank robberies, Guns? cars, oh, cars. <laughs> right? Um, uh, but, um, you know, I think there's going to be an interesting struggle because I think that our, our security agencies are going to push to limit drones sharply and I think our industry is going to push, not, like, push back. Um, and a lot of it will do with we'll ha how it turns out we'll have to do, I mean, for us, civil liberties wise, the worst case scenario is the government is allowed to use drones for surveillance everywhere, but nobody can use drones themselves to take photographs of the government. Um, uh, but I think a lot will depend on what actually happens. How much of a problem does it actually turn out to be? And how much are people willing to tolerate it? There's certain things we tolerate, like ve vehicular, you know, 30,000 people a year die in car accidents and however many people die in gunshot wounds, but we don't tolerate any, you know, a passenger aircraft deaths, uh, or hardly any. Um, so we'll have to see where the drones fall on that continuum. Chris, you had a comment? Yeah, yeah I, I would Security? certainly agree that, that the potential for deliberate misuse shouldn't drive safety regulation. I mean, there's a fundamental difference. If we, if we all sit together in a room with a bunch of smart people, you can do some pretty good analysis on what sorts of things might happen in, in the way of malfunctions and things breaking and things not working right. But there's effectively no limit to the, the number of different ways that people with intent to do harm can do that. So it, it, I agree completely that it shouldn't drive uh, the full body of safety regulations. I, I would point out that there's a little bit of overlap uh, in, in one instance at least that comes to mind that uh, one of the difficulties I mentioned earlier of having UAS in controlled airspace is what does ATC have to do with it? And, and a big part of that is that it's extremely difficult to see a small unmanned aircraft uh, either visually or electronically. Uh, whereas if, if, you know, if we start developing that technology, that might have some security implications in the sense of, you know, I, I hope our friends in the Secret Service are working real hard on how to figure <laughs> out uh, how to, to not only keep people from jumping the White House fence, but uh, to keep small unmanned aircraft or any, any kind of vehicle. Gyrocopters. Or gyrocopters, <laughs> yeah. Uh, I mean, there's, there's things out there that traditional surveillance in the air traffic control sense can't see. Uh, and if that were to be developed as a security countermeasure, it would have application in the, in the safety world as well. But by and large, I think you have to look at the, the differences between intent to do harm versus just looking at malfunctions. Well, we've, we've been talking for a while, so why don't we uh, see if the audience has any input or questions or comments? Okay, there's one right off the bat. John's got one right <laughs> off the bat. He wants to get started on I think there's a microphone uh, down here. The thought of one word been mentioned about uh, the, the unregulated, total un unregulated area of hang glass, power hang glass. Well, we're not talking about two pound uh, phantoms. We're talking about somebody as big as I am flying around on a big kite that has no regulation, no requirements flies in any airspace they want, and they go up pretty high. I've seen a number of pieces you can't even tell uh, 
much about what the, the vehicle is. So I like to find out, especially you, Chris, and with friends in the real life. <laughs> <laughs> and Brendan, your thoughts on that? Well, I, I think it's a great question, John. Uh, and I, I don't know off the top of my head if ALPA had a position on hang gliding regulation, but you make an excellent point. Uh, the, the only difference I can see is that at least there's a person on board a, hang, a powered hang glider who has skin in the game and as a result uh, may pay more attention to his or her training uh, and some of the safety rules that are out there even if they're voluntary. Uh, but it's a great point, and, and it, I think it goes to the idea that we're not just talking about the, the two kilogram quadcopter that we all tend to bring to mind uh, when we have this discussion. So I, I, wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't have any problem with the discussion about what sort of regulations ought to be put in place there either. The, the thing that, that we have pointed out a couple of times uh, full disclosure here, when this, the whole discussion started, we went on the internet and bought one just to see what it was like. And it sits in one of our offices there in engineering and air safety in, in Herndon. Uh, out of the box, the thing says it can go to 6,000 feet. So when we talk about limiting the aircraft to certain areas, uh, you know, as you correctly point out, there's aircraft out there that can go where they ought not to be. And that, that to me, suggests the need for some sort of regulation or standard or guideline or, you know, we can have the discussion as to how, how stringent it ought to be, but it's not just a matter of where, where people are supposed to be, it's where it can be, and do they have a motivation or uh, is there a malfunction possibility that will let it get where it ought not to be? So I, I think you make a great point. So I, I think, actually I was going to raise this, uh, but we didn't have time in response to some of the comments about failure risk. I, I think there's just a fundamental difference. If there's nobody at all on board, um, even if you have that, that eighth <coughs> motor fail or the fourth motor in a quadcopter, almost always it's inconsequential. It's going to fall down to the ground in a field somewhere. Maybe it'll break a window or something like that. You don't have somebody's life in danger every single time you have a failure. And I think that's a big part of the, of the risk analysis. And, and should be separated from this question of, well, what if they fly in a place that poses a danger to other aircraft? I'm very sympathetic to that. Uh, or if a malfunction causes it to fly somewhere else. Um, but if you look at the system itself, they weigh only a few pounds, especially in the micro category that we proposed. And I think, I think John, you're absolutely right. I mean, for ultralight vehicles, there's no airworthiness certification. There's no pilot training. There's no minimum age. I mean, one of the things in this proposal um, is, is an age, um, minimum age requirement of 17. So if you want to fly an unmanned aircraft system, a small one, for any purpose other than that strict hobby category, so including education, including volunteer search and rescue, apparently, you've got to be at least 17. Um, not true for an ultralight vehicle. And I, I don't understand that, because that's, you know, 16-year-old is not necessarily someone, yeah, maybe there's skin in the game, but are they really thinking about whether the bolts are tight on the thing they made in their garage. And a person's on board and they're thousands of feet in the air. So if they do have a malfunction, they're in danger and that's like 300 pounds coming down on someone's head below. So I think the point is a very valid one. We have to measure the real safety risks and also take it into account the benefits. I mean, these, these, the, these drones are really gonna save people's lives. You've got people going up and doing cell phone tower inspection. And every year, I think around eight or 10 people fall off and die, okay? just to get pictures of the cell phone towers. So if you can send a small drone up there to get the picture and come down, I don't, I don't think the failure analysis matters. If you have a malfunction and it crashes, it hits the power line, it falls to the ground, those power lines are not in, in dense locations. Typically, they're out in the country. They've got the right of way cut out in the forest. You've seen those when you drive on the highway, right? So, and they're not near airports. So you go out and you, and you inspect that, and you've, right away, you've saved eight lives a year if you replace that dangerous uh, mode of inspection with something that's safer. And I think you need to take that benefit into account before you start saying things like, well, if you have a failure, we can't ensure the safety, it's going to malfunction and crash. I get that, but there's no one on board. But by the same token, when, when I talk about failure, uh, we, I think we have to keep in mind we're talking about a, a body of regulations, or potentially a body of regulations, that apply to more than just those airplanes. And 
you know, I take your point about the micro versus bigger than micro. Uh, and, and that's potentially part of the discussion as to do we, would we need a design standard for that just because we may need a design standard for a 50 pound vehicle or a 300 pound vehicle, ultimately something like that. I, I think there's room for uh, graduation of how much regulation and how much uh, standard, how many standards are applied and, and in what manner. Uh, you make a good point. You know, your comment was that the, the quadcopter, when a motor fails, it almost always lands or just falls to the ground. It's the almost part that bothers me when we start applying that philosophy to larger and larger, more sophisticated aircraft. I, I, I agree. The larger systems, higher altitudes, interacting with man traffic, th those require greater regulation. I agree. Carl had a question in the middle. Thank you. Um, there, there are, I think, approximately 6,000 airports in the country. The vast majority of those are small, privately owned, and municipal airports. Out predominantly in rural countries, uh, rural parts of the country, around agriculture, where a lot of these, well, a lot of the market for these drones is taking place, or at least going to be targeted. And every student pilot has the experience of flying 15, 20, 30 nautical miles from their home airport, and the flight instructor reaches over and pulls the throttle back. He says, uh oh, you've just lost an engine, where are we going to go? You pick out a field, and private pilots have this every time they do a biannual flight with you as well. You circle down, and you get onto a final approach to a field. Uh, pretty low, actually, if you're in a rural area. And that's not only a normal part of flight training, and it's happening every single day, all over the country. That's a necessary part of every pilot's ability to stay current in my completely unscientific and anecdotal survey of uh, other private pilots. The concern about an exploding market of drones for commercial purposes ranges from mild concern to terror. And I have to admit that my feelings range closer to the terror end of the spectrum than mild concern. And I wonder if the panel here could tell me why my fears and concerns are completely irrational and where I'm going to go. Well, uh, speaking uh, as someone who does the same thing, I guess that uh, A, it is hard to envision a future where, uh, not that I don't think it won't happen with a proliferation of drones beyond what we have today in some order of magnitude that will make an operation that you're talking about uh, dangerous. Uh, you know, I'm much more worried when I'm down at a low altitude over a field, again, of, of a bird uh, or some other object that's coming up, a tower, um, a wind turbine now, um, than I am uh, most of the kinds of drones that I think we'll see proliferate in the kind of private use. Now, you know, you use the example of out in the field where there's going to be agricultural operations. I guess those, some of those drones might be larger, although I think a lot of what I've seen for agricultural use is still in the relatively uh, small size. Um, the pounds is still going to bring down 9172. Really? Oh, I think so. If I'm, I'm dead. Well, talk to Adam. I don't think so. Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure either. I mean, I, I think it depends on, you know, there's also discussion <laughs> two pounds of what matters also. So two pounds of, of steel uh, that you run into might, uh, I wouldn't want to run into that either. Two pounds of whatever sort of plastic uh, that's made of, I think, is a different quality. Certainly, I'd rather run into two pounds of that than two pounds of, of a goose. Um, so, uh, not that I, 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 again, not that I hear your concern, um, but... I think you'd have to imagine just a blanket of drums uh, above the field, and I don't really see that as being the future. Um, but maybe I'm short-sighted. I, I think that, like for example, the uh, Sensefly EB is a, a, a styrofoam drone that weighs under two pounds, does agriculture mapping. It's up for a few minutes, it's down, and it's done. So you know these operations are quick. Um, you know, part of the procedure for operating safely is going to be to pay attention to the surrounding airspace. You know, you've got, I, I always say this, and people 
who buy for a living don't appreciate it, you, you're outside looking up. So you can hear approaching aircraft in a way that you can't if you're inside the cockpit of a 747 or Cessna or whatever. So you have this extra sense on the ground and you can hear the crop duster approaching or I, I, you know, maybe if the engine is, is shut off or on idle, uh, it's harder to hear and I appreciate that specific scenario as being maybe a little bit different and a higher risk. Um, but whoever's operating is there watching and observing what's going on around him. And if you see a plane that's circling to land on a field, I think you're going to stop what you're doing with the drone. So you know, the question is, are we trying to get to zero risk? I don't think there's any aspect of aviation that has zero risk. Um, you'd have to ban a lot of stuff, including all the crop dust. Have you seen what the crop dusting aircraft do? They're flying under power lines, and it's kind of amazing and, and scary. And they're doing that in the same place that you want to land on your emergency practice. So I think at some point, yes, there, there's going to be a risk that needs to be balanced with all the benefits. And I don't think that in the farmland you're going to see thousands of drones persistently hovering over farmland. There's just no application that would require that. It's up and down in minutes. In the back. Thank you. My name is Albert Cucciarelli. I am, I am pleased to say that my client does have one of those 333 exemptions, which is one of the, uh, the 200 or so that you mentioned. And it, it, it says in the 333 that we have to file a notice three days in advance of every flight. So then we followed up and we obtained a certificate waiver, which should allow multiple flights, uh, I, I would say on the start of the moment, if you will, because this is a, a, a very vibrant commercial, uh, commercial operation. However, it too requires advance notice. You have to file a note, notice to airmen 24 hours prior, at least 24 hours prior to each use. So it's, it's still pretty onerous. And, and these are for operations 200 feet and below. So if there's any doubt about whether the FAA considers 200 feet and below, whether you're below the class E, the, Class G, whatever air state you're in, clearly they're asserting that jurisdiction. If he flies his drone 10 feet above the ground, he has to fly, he has to file a notice to airmen uh, 24 hours prior to the commercial use of that vehicle. And interestingly enough, if I do that for a hobby, I think, as you point out, I don't have to do it. We have the same distinctions, you know, between Part 91 and Parts 121 and 135, private versus commercial operations, where we're regulating essentially the same activity. I'll take five passengers on a Saturday, my plane up to Nantucket, private operation. If I collect any money from them, nothing to do with the flying. Now it's a commercial operation and I'm subject to a whole different set of regulations. So the FAA's regulatory framework, by carrying over the legacy of what they do for, you know, for, for the manned aircraft into the world of UAVs, and unfortunately is putting us on a very confused and, and somewhat, uh, you know, I guess, willy-nilly sort of regulation. And we've experienced it, so we're, we're pleased to have it, but it isn't all that it's cracked up to be. And I'd also point out it expires in two years. And hopefully it will be renewed, maybe even uh, maybe better. But it's hard to build a business when you have a two-year license to proceed. Well, it's also limited to whatever you applied for six months ago or three months ago. So a lot of people that got them based on the Inspire One, or certainly the Phantom Two Vision or the Two Vision Plus, if they buy the Phantom 3 that just came out, they have to go through this entire exemption process all over again. And I think that's an incredible burden. And I it's a very interesting point because he actually does have another model for which we are now applying for an amendment to the exemption. And he has to provide an operating manual and, and, uh, and so on for that model. So each time you change vehicles, you've got to get an amendment to your, your 333 exemption. So the FAA has certainly asserted its jurisdiction right to the ground though, in respect to commercial operations. Albert, could you satisfy our curiosity and let us know what you're doing with that? Well, I can ask my client how much he wants to say about that. He, it's actually, it's a very- It's, it's always interesting. interesting. Well, the question was well, the use of the 333. Uh, ours is multiple use. Um, we didn't go in for one sole purpose. Um, our main focus is public service, as somebody had mentioned, search and rescue. Um, another one is education is a big one, um, you know, for just for the reasons that we're talking about here tonight. And, um, you know, we feel that, um, you know, I, I don't think the numbers of these things uh, are ever going to slow down. I don't think the FAA is ever going to catch up. And, you know, the only way to make this safe for all of us 
and give us possibly a legitimate future in this business is to educate the people that are you know not doing this correctly or don't know how to do it correctly. I would like to say, Frank made a very good point to me, Frank Alella, he's the owner of Lincoln Park Aviation and operating the UAV business on the next generation aviation services, and you can see his exemption online. But Frank made a very good point to me a few minutes ago, he said, you know, we're trying to regulate the users. Maybe the key here is to regulate the manufacturers. So what drones can do and cannot do is, is uh, what's available on the shelf. And, and that, in turn, would maybe have collision avoidance systems in it and, uh, you know, and other, other aspects of you know, you have an engine out, it still continue to fly. <coughs> but anyway, that would be another approach to the regulation. Regulate the, the manufacturers so we can only buy those drones that have certain capabilities, <coughs> such as collision avoidance, not the users, who in many cases have no clue about aviation until they buy their first you know, toy drone and then they take it up from there to, to bigger and heavier drones. Is it, is it problematic, and uh, this is probably for you rather than educational purposes like they describe teaching other people how to fly are considered non-hobby, non-recreational, or therefore oh, I, lumped in with the same requirements? I think it's huge, and I think it's going to be a huge burden on our students and I think on the future. I mean, how do you get people trained for this new technology if the schools can't train them? And one thing that was very disappointing to me was to find out that the students um, that were so excited about this competition that they were going to participate in and build their own drone, which they did, and then to have the competition canceled because of concerns about the legality of the competition is, is just so dismaying to me. And um, I, I think that it's, it's just such overreach to include research and training in the same category with purely commercial use. Plus, one of the absurdities, the um, Auburn University just got a, an exemption to uh, do flight training, which is great, except, of course, the, the school, the instructor has to have a, a pilot certificate. But then the students uh, wouldn't be able to manipulate the controls of the drone unless they themselves had a pilot certificate, which would really be kind of ridiculous at our school where we have so many students in the flight instruction program. So as student pilots without a license, they can fly manned aircraft and go up to 25 miles or 50 miles, depending on where they are, but they wouldn't be able to manipulate the controls of Phantom or a student-built drone because they didn't have a pilot's license. Yeah. Sounds like you have a square peg in a round hole problem, at least right now. <laughs> yes. Um, There's another, oh, okay. Uh, for old Rector, maybe this is for Jay. Um, I, if I recall, the president has tasked the NTIA, is that the agency, to look at privacy issues from the administration's point of view? Do you know where they're going on that or how that might come out? Um, President Obama signed an executive order creating a multi-stakeholder <coughs> process, um, uh, if I recall correctly, um, and um, that, that process will begin uh, shortly. And he, uh, yeah, so um, where that will go, uh, I don't know. I mean, does that have the potential of creating limitations that we have not envisioned? I think that I think that it's aimed towards um, industry standards more than regulation, um, and that can be very influential, um, especially as an industry gets more mature. I'm not sure that the industry is very mature now, but um, it could, you know, it, it could certainly be considering that we're in sort of a, you know formative years of this in, of, of this industry. It could, you know, it could prove significant. Okay. With one more question, okay, in the back.
So I'd never really thought about Riley um, in the context of drones. Um, I guess a drone contains a camera, which contains data, and so in that sense, it's similar to a phone. Um, I mean, Riley, Riley decided that, that the, a cell phone couldn't be searched incident to arrest because it contained so much more information. Like, basically, you'd have to carry, in the pre-digital era, like a trunk around with you with, with, with many papers to be the equivalent of one of the justices wrote. Um, um, I'm not sure how that applies to drones. Um, but, uh, uh, yeah, maybe there's some connection that I don't get. But, um, and then on the pretextual, I mean, we're always concerned that um, that government agencies interested in doing surveillance will engage, you know, will 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 skirt uh, restrictions through pretextual means. Um, and we're also concerned that safety uh, will be safety restrictions on drones will be used as a pretext to prevent photography, as we saw in um, in Ferguson. Arguably, and, and I think that's it's likely we'll see that elsewhere. I mean, we, we think that safety restrictions on drones are legitimate, and we don't we don't know we're not experts in safety, so we leave that to safety people. But we, what we're concerned with is that safety will be used as an excuse to squelch um, oversight. We also have a question for Chris. So that the camera can hear okay. the question is about why there's an insistence on categorizing various, making distinctions and categories among different types of unmanned aircraft based on width, <coughs> as opposed to in, in uh, jurisprudence regarding privacy, there are different, there, there are different distinctions between the categories. Well, I, I can offer an opinion, uh, not, not, I mean, we're a regulated party, not a regulator, so I can't tell you exactly why the FAA chose to do that, but I think from a practical application standpoint, it makes a certain amount of sense that, uh, as, as we've said many times up here this evening, we've pointed out that there are some fundamental differences between small aircraft, somewhat larger aircraft, even larger aircraft, and when you start talking about regulations in place that uh, are, are constructed to address both either operation or construction of an aircraft to be flown in the airspace, it, it's a practical way to uh, apply standards based on the perceived risk. It's not the only way to measure it. Uh, and if I understand your question correctly, I, it sounds like you're talking about the, the Another option being regulate based on, on use. Do I understand that correctly? Right, and I, I think there's probably room in the discussion for characteristics, uh, perhaps not in terms of whether it has a camera or not, but if it has the capability to go to Three, five, ten thousand feet, and go 200 miles an hour. That might need to have a different set of restrictions uh, or considerations applied than something that doesn't even have the capability to fly above 100 feet or 500 feet or whatever the number might be. Uh, but in terms of regulating based on whether it has a camera or not, that's. Uh, I think that would be something you'd really have to address to the FAA. Uh, I actually sold a lot of equipment, a lot of unmanned aircraft equipment to 
law enforcement at different agencies in the Northeast here, and all seem to complain that they can't get the code that they need to fly for public use, I guess. Uh, do you or any of the panel members have any insight on that as to why the issues of that is so limited? It's probably not for me because that's an FAA regulatory thing. And I, I, I was talking about in 2013, I think there are more now. And I, and I think I was thinking mainly of sort of the number of departments that were actively flying them. I think there were probably a lot, significantly more that actually had COAs. Um, I don't know. But um, I, I kept going to drone conferences in 2013, and there would be the same six police departments always represented at them all. It seemed to be the ones who were experimenting with the technology. So I, I know EFF did a FOIA, uh, did a FOIA and, and found a much longer list of um, COAs that have been issued. Um, but in terms of the bureaucratic process, I know that the police, uh, the police officials that I hung out with at all these drone conferences complained a lot. <laughs> yeah, it seems like law enforcement uh, is restricted mostly. I don't know if that's because of the you know, persistent surveillance or whatever that the public might be concerned about, um, or if it's just a general restriction on law enforcement to take the phone as two codes. Well, I mean, it was, it was easier for public agencies to get a, to fly a drone through a COA, a lot easier than for a private um, company, um, sure. at least then. There seems to be an exception for specific law enforcement. I don't know, nothing written, but I don't know if there's any. You're saying that it appears to be more difficult for a law enforcement agency to get a COA as opposed to other public agencies? Right, every single police agency I've sold to has not been able to obtain the proper permission to They still do it, they still take care of photography or crime scenes and whatnot, but they just, uh, their gripe is that you know, the fire department down the street can get one, but we can't. I, I don't know if anybody's. I've been successful with a couple of clients, including a couple of law enforcement agencies, at getting COAs, but I can tell you that the challenge with a law enforcement agency is they can't always be specific enough in the COA application process about what they're going to be doing, where they're going to operate, and when they're going to operate because of the open nature of what police departments do. And so that presents a challenge for them. A lot of them have had to just frame what they're doing as um, kind of research, uh, maybe training at training events. But uh, the fact that they are asking for an open-ended application, I think, does present challenges for them. Yeah. Um, I, I, it seems to me that historically, the FAA has been reactive rather than proactive. Generally, most regulations, including air traffic control, essentially existing to the accident historically. And um, Brent and I did some analysis and were able to gather a little data, but sort of what I find interesting is how little data there is and how much of what we're talking about here is kind of speculation. And I think that's part of the problem is there is enough data and the FAA is reactive to what's happened in the past and there is a big mismatch. I guess the question is sort of what kind of data can be gathered and, and what other <coughs> data is necessary to have this sort of conversation make more sense and, and uh, regulations make more sense? So a Adam's question was uh, what kind of data could be gathered. There seems to be an absence of, of data uh, and I agree. Um, one of the interesting things about the 2012 statute is that Congress directed the FAA to set up at least, text, uh, at least six uh, test sites across the country to conduct you know, testing and, and, and analysis. Uh, those were defined in the statute, test site is a geographical area, and there's another section in the statute that says the FAA, the administrator, should conduct all testing required uh, to uh, implement the rules. So it was supposed to be an admittedly unfunded um, objective of the agency, as per Congress, to get that testing done at six, at least six geographical locations. The FAA took that statute, they, they read statutes <coughs> in different ways, but they took that statute and said, well, we don't have the resources to set up test sites. We're going to allow states uh, to compete for the right to administer their own test sites, set up these agencies, and they did pick six, uh, um, they're not six states, they're really six test facilities run by approximately six states, including there's one in New York, up in Griffiths Airport, there's one in partnership New York and uh, New Jersey and Virginia. But the interesting thing about all that, and it's now set up, it's been running for you know, about a year, those sites, is that you, you need a COA, right? So suddenly you've got to go and show the FAA that what you're proposing to do is safe, 
you know, you've got safe operation of an unmanned aircraft system. Here's the problem, and I've talked to administrators at the test sites, and they say this is completely aggravating because at a test site, you go and you break things. You're in the middle of nowhere. What you want to do is go and crash and see what happens, or, or try something a little risky and see what the failure is. You know, take, take out that, set, that eighth motor and see what the other seven do, and do it 100 times. But you'll never satisfy the FAA that doing that intentionally is in a safe operation. Yet that's what a test site should be in the middle of the Nevada desert where one of the test sites is. So you've got this kind of weird um, mentality of, okay, we need the data. The FAA will, will tell various people along the way, if you ask them, yes, we're lacking data, we need that. And we have these test sites that gather data, and yet they're not really allowing the kinds of um, destructive testing that I think would be required. There's one more in the back. Oh, go ahead, Chris. A, yeah. a couple of things came to mind with your question. Uh, one is that in, in the traditionally piloted aircraft world, the FAA, uh, as you may know, is moving far away from reactive quickly. Uh, there's a thing called the Commercial Aviation Safety Team, and the program is called uh, like ASIAS, the Aviation Safety Information Analysis and Sharing, that capitalize on the fact that in, especially the airline world, we have so much data now coming off of airplanes, and we have developed the capability to collect and analyze that data in a, in a responsible manner. And a lot of what you see coming out of the FAA now is based, it is now becoming proactive based on all that data. So your point is, is very well taken, I think, that if there were a way to collect that kind of data, it would be very valuable. And I think one of the things you see in the NPRM, for example, is discussion about accident reporting. Uh, and whether that makes the final cut in the rule, I don't know, but there, if there were to be a way for all these folks out there operating UAS to be able to catalog failures, problems, you know, not necessarily even malfunctions, just, you know, uh, difficulties they encountered in operation, I think you'd have a tremendous wealth of data that could then be used to develop perhaps more appropriate safety regulations. I mean, th think of this problem. You've got, so you, maybe you're a company that's designing and building these things, and you want to go out and do some testing, get, get, gather data, and maybe turn it over to the FAA. What's, what's your problem? You've been operating commercially without permission. You, know, you don't have a certificate, and you wouldn't be able to get a certificate to go do crash testing, because that wouldn't sound safe, and maybe you don't have certificated pilots. I mean, it's like this catch-22. It's almost like Kafka. Like you, you want, to, you want to help the industry, you want to develop these technologies, you want to get, gather the data, and the regulator's saying, well, wait a second, you can't do anything yet, and let's wait 10 years to have the rules. You know, Amazon gets an experimental certificate for a drone that they, they stopped testing eight months ago. That's not useful at all. This technology is, is developing so rapidly that it really requires a, a very different regulatory response, and in part because there's no one on board. If you have an aircraft, uh, a passenger aircraft, and you want to do testing, you know, I understand you want a, a, an experimental certificate because you've got somebody, the test pilot's life is in danger as soon as you do the first test flight. And that's just not true for these systems. And yet we're using the same framework um, for these as, as for the manned aircraft. And we're not allowing that data. I think that's impeding the collection of data or if the data exists, there may be some reluctance to turn it over because you're showing the FAA not only that you were operating commercially, but that you're breaking stuff, you're crashing. Did you have a question about that? Yeah. First, my name is Daniel Rothschild, just an interested attorney here. Uh, a couple of quick questions, and you sort of already touched on it about Amazon, how they want to deliver products to people's private homes. And I'm just wondering your thoughts on this commercial use and how this will affect it. But my second question has to do with those, you remember those Google vehicles, they drive around, they take street view pictures. Several years ago in Germany, not only were they taking those street view pictures, but they were also collecting data about Wi-Fi spots and other things in the same vehicle. And then, the German court there found that to be an invasion of privacy. So do you think that there should be regulations on drones that could potentially be gathering uh, data on their way the same way Google did? I think there should be regulations on that conduct, regardless of what technology you use to invade privacy that way. So whether you're driving by in a car and collecting the Wi-Fi data, whether it's a drone, whether it's some device no one has yet invented, um, you're hacking into a, a cell phone network to get it, 
it doesn't matter to me. And, and what I see, though, is this, because of the word drone, because of the military use, because of uh, you know, the cameras are on board, there's a knee-jerk reaction. And so you get this, this sense that, while well, it's a drone taking my picture, it's creepy. Um, but it's just like any other technology. And if you've got an identified misuse, like persistent surveillance without a warrant, fine, let's, let's, let's regulate that or prohibit it or require a warrant. But I would say technology neutral. It, it doesn't matter that it's a drone. What matters is, is the use to which it's being put. As far as drone delivery, I, I think in the next few years we're going to have to work on our roofs accepting packages. <laughs> With that, we are approaching the witching hour. Uh, so uh, I'd like to take one second to thank the panel for giving us their time tonight. I thought we had a lot of great insights about the industry. And uh, if they're willing to uh, hang around for a few minutes and engage some of the folks that have stayed here right till the end, I, I think that would also be fantastic. Uh, I wanted to thank Allison Sakuf the chair of our aeronautics committee for helping to organize this great event and Sharon DeVivo from Vaughn College and the volunteers from Vaughn College that she brought along with her. We really appreciate it. Uh, thanks very much for coming out tonight. Okay.